55% of the people that they looked at say that spending will actually go up this year. That's really great news for a salesperson, right? Somebody who's trying to sell a solution. But the other thing that's happening is 86% of them said the scrutiny is going up too. Because of that, a salesperson has to figure out even more how to help educate that buyer because they're going to get more scrutiny. That buyer, through their internal processes, through legal, through procurement, and everyone else, it's going to be harder to get that sell, that purchase through. Today, we welcome Rick Kicker, the co-founder of RevLogic, the market-leading AI-powered revenue enablement as a service firm. Prior to setting up RevLogic, Rick has spent the last 18-odd years leading enablement under the infamous leadership of Dali Rajik at both Zscaler and AppDynamics, which undoubtedly set the gold standards in go-to-market sales execution. Rick has worked with so many of our guests, it was only fair that we got him on the show to share some of his wisdom and some of those learnings. The show is packed full of insightful information, and for those that know Rick, full of energy. This is his playbook. Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns. I'm Simon Kutis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Welcome back to the show, everyone. And it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Rick Kicker. Rick, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Actually, before we get started. Go on. All right. I mean, oh, 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 no, no, no. Right right off the bat, right? and I told you, this is going to be different. I promised you, okay. if you come on the show, we're going to make this is going to become more complicated. I love it. All love right. It so the very first time I met you, yeah, you were wearing a Hunters and Unicorns hat, a hoodie. Yeah. Uh, I think it said 100. Uh, you got the swag. We got the you, swag. You've got, got the, the swag. swag. And that's actually how I knew I was going to like you right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> I also knew how to dress for this because I think I saw like AV wearing a suit jacket. I saw a guy from um, uh, uh, Bug... Uh, bug Crowds. Uh, bug oh, yeah, Crowd yeah, 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 wearing Jerry. like a black vest and yeah, a black yeah, yeah. t-shirt. Yeah. So I knew it was all over the place. So yeah. I was like, you know, I'm just going to go with what you guys wear. Oh, okay. But I, I also want you to know, I, I came bearing gifts. 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 Okay. Oh, wow. Right. Hold on. <laughs> Off camera here for a second. So, here we oh, go. Here my we go. Goodness. I want you. I want you right here. <laughs> wow. It, there it we go. Tags off, but Look at that. Right, coming on there, so you know that's that's fresh. That right is there. fresh. That is so, definitely fresh. There yeah. we go. Um, now Simon and, hasn't got any hair, so he can wear it. I've done my hair today. Nah. Uh, but do but I have to wear? Don't right, you wake right, up with hair looking you. like that? This All is right, for you. There we this go. is for you. Nice. There we go. That's perfect. We're gonna exchange hats at some point here, right? Where's our? Because I wear hats all the ceremonies at the at the end of the show. Oh, okay. You don't get yours till the end of the show. Unless it's a good show, okay. Then you get it. If it's bad, you don't get it. It's gonna be a good show. It's gonna be a good show. It's a tough start. It's a tough start. It's a tough start. I don't know. So and swag is so important. I mean, like Mm. let's let's start with that for just a minute because I have like put a lot of been through a lot of different iterations of the hat. Got some sweatshirts, things like that. I'm sure you can agree. You got to look cool while you're having that. Yeah. And for people that have like walked into their first boot camp at a company, they just left the company that they love. And now they go into boot camp and they're getting swag that's like all of a sudden it's a cheap water bottle where like the cap breaks off the minute they open it. All right. Or they get the t-shirt where the sleeves, which you got good sleeves, sleeves. but the sleeves that like only come down to here and they're yeah, so yeah. tight up in your armpit yeah, that yeah, it actually yeah, makes yeah. your deodorant hurt <laughs> to wear, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Then you yeah, then yeah. it's immediately now the company's trying to get over the hurdle of that yeah. they gave all their employees bad swag. So <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Oh. And is this a way of getting RevLogic, your new organization, congratulations on that, by the way, into <laughs> this? And this is his way of being able to um yeah, produce a little plug. marketing. A little, no, we'll love I, don't, a bit. We'll I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but it is RevLogic slash Rev slash Logic dot right. com. Go check it out if you have time. <laughs> awesome. I love the start. We're in for a treat today. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you start with a question. I'll start with a question. I'll start with a question. Are we being interviewed? Rick has stepped onto the show and he's taken over. <laughs> no, there is a question there is for me. Yeah. I, I promise I'll go ahead and answer it, but you're gonna have to ask it again because I already. Already forgot it. I don't think you even gave him time to ask the question. <laughs> right. I'll ask the question. I'll ask the question. Uh, so, <laughs> welcome to Hunters and Unicorns and Red Logic. <laughs> so, what's interesting, uh, Rick, is that you've worked with many, many 
of the amazing people that we've had on the show over the years, right? You've you've been part of the enablement teams of some of the best, most revered um, executives within the lineage. Um, and be really good to just understand a little bit more about, about that. So help us understand a little bit about in what capacity, who you've worked with, just to kind of... Set the scene. Set yes. the scene, yeah. Absolutely. I. You like stories, I like stories. I so story. go, I'll tell a story. So yeah. when I believe I, I first met you guys, and, mm -hmm. and Ali, it was you first, yep. and it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. But I had heard of the Hunters and Unicorns podcast. I actually didn't know the other arm that you had, which was the recruiting side. And um, we were talking about an opportunity that might have been out there. And as as I was prepping, like every good person does, they, they prep and do discovery for their yeah. call, right? And um, I start looking at the podcast that you were doing. And I think you've got, what is it, the 30 for 30 or 40 to 40? 30, yeah, 30, 33 30, CXOs. 33. Yeah, it couldn't be 30. It couldn't be 40. It's got to yeah, be 33. Yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. So 33 CXOs. Yeah. And I'm going through the list of all the people I have in the podcast. And I start kind of chuckling to myself and I started writing down the names. And I think I showed you to it you on did, the Zoom, yeah. right? There's a, and in the notebook, I, I think I showed like 70 or 70% 70 of the people that you had on those podcasts were people that I have been blessed with the opportunity to work with and help enable their teams or help enable them. And, you know, from my perspective, I, I just think that, you know, everybody who joins here on your podcast has a story mm. of, they wouldn't be where they're at today if they didn't have that opportunity, some type of blessing in their life. And I think mine was that, that and I, I said this in one of the LinkedIn posts that I put when I had just left my former company, is that at Zscale, or I'm sorry, at, at AppDynamics, it was learned from legends. Mm -hmm. And those legends are people that you've had on that podcast. And I've had an opportunity to advise for some other companies and be able to expand on learnings from all of these people. So what is enablement? What role does enablement play within, within that? Yeah. So if you think about, I'll just name some names here. Mm. Um, and I'm not picking on any certain person on purpose, but like- You've you got know, some favorites, we know. That's Go right, on. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, Ernest is probably going to talk about the oh, why, right? I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in, there, in the why. David Boyle, I think you had, was talking about the value framework. I'm Absolutely, sure AV yeah. probably talked about skill will at some point in his conversation. If he didn't bring him back on to talk about it. it. Right. Um, Flo, I, I, if I had a guess, is probably talking about things around like, um, champion building, discovery, um, uh, who else did, uh, Aspen, uh, Aspen, Aspen was probably yeah. talking about internal champion building, things like that. So yep. right, all of that, all of that is, you know, that's the voice of the leader. That's the voice of a great person and what they want to put as a culture into their company. But it's really difficult to be able to enable that culture across the board across the entire go-to market. In some areas, it even starts with getting marketing and the business leaders and all the entire ecosystem on board also. And I think that's the role that enablement plays. Enablement helps take what are the goals of that CRO, of that business leader, and we're going to align with those goals. And then we're going to expand that for every single new hire that walks through the door. Before they even step foot in the company, we want them to understand what a value framework is, what great positioning, discovery, being able to do all of those things that all of these people that you've had in this series talk about and make it into the DNA. Yeah. Weave it into the fabric of the day-to-day -day operational cadence of that company. And I really believe that's the role that enablement plays. So doing what you're doing, obviously you have to be really in amongst it. You're in amongst the weeds. You're obviously trying to interpret the corporate initiative, the, the leadership initiative. You're trying to grapple with the actual day-to-day -day implementation and dealing with the real application of all of these hypothetical or, or utopian concepts and actually trying to create, get traction within, within the people to actually be able to execute. Help me understand a little bit, or help us understand a little bit about how that how that transpires and 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 why that's so important and how that unique perspective allows you to kind of be have your finger on the pulse of how to to further iterate and to keep evolving how how this needs to change. 
Okay, so that was a really long question. That was, was. Yeah. about six yeah, in so there. I'm going to try and dissect that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you know, from what, from digesting what a, what you want to put into a company. So depending on where they're at in their different stages. So maybe at an early stage company, like App Dynamics was, right, they have different goals. The leaders are looking for different things that they want to be able to increase on. Maybe that's conversion rates. Maybe that's, you know, how do we train a sales team and get them wrapped up, ramped up as fast as possible? Maybe it's looking at how do we improve our productive capacity inside the company? All of those things. And those are different levers, different dials that we're going to turn to be able to try and help accomplish that for the business leader. But I think it starts with what are the business goals? Everyone's got the goal of wanting more revenue. I, I haven't met a single person that says, ah, <laughs> no, no, we're good with revenue. Let's, let's go spend more money. I, so now it's, how are we going to, as an enablement team, my goal is to enable revenue. My goal is not to just enable people, not just to enable sales. And I think, you know, one of the other things we could talk about is just how the story came up of how I even ended up in this, this business today. And um, it was from being the buyer on the other side. So I, a person like um, like Tom Schmidt, who was also on the show, like mm. I probably wouldn't be in the role that I'm in today if I had not met him. And if I had not been sitting on the other side of the table across from Tom and one of the best salespeople I had ever met by the name of Mike Ruffner. Right. And sitting and in ex in experiencing what selling is happening to me and having done that for 10 years, and been what would they what would you call the economic buyer or the champion? Um, it's a, it allowed me to learn like what do the best salespeople do for buyers? And when they walked into my office, did they already know what was on my whiteboard and the projects that I were working on and how they could align to those things? How could they could help solve? Do they see a path to revenue on those things? So when they walked in, they were immediately relevant. They were immediately able to talk about how they could solve my business problems. And everything that, from an enablement perspective, that myself, my teams, the people that I've worked with, we all try and keep that in mind of, how do we make buying easier? And, and that's kind of, to bring it back to your question, that's how we try and say, all right, if a leader wants to accomplish these different type of goals, they want to put in a value framework, let's talk about how that actually helps the buyer and where we want, and what lever is that going to push? I think it's... It, I, I, Desperate to get deep into some of the, the the nuances of what you're talking about there, um, but at the same time, I think is as you said, we're, we're going back into back in time and starting your journey. And I think, you know, you you said you started as you know as 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 the buyer. You were then introduced to App Dynamics, and you stepped into being a consultant. How did you get into enablement from that position? Uh, it's a great story. So. <clears throat> um, Again, I mentioned I was on the buyer side yeah. and working at a company called Blue Cross with Shield. And I was just about ready to leave. And I'd been there for 10 years, had a great, great run there. But I was, as you can tell, I got a lot of energy. <laughs> and my energy was towards, I want to go do something myself. I want to go build my own company. And um, I had mentioned this again to uh, one of the sales reps that I was working with at the time, who's turned out to be a, a great friend of mine, friends of the family. His name's Mike and, um, and Tom Schmidt. And they said, I think, I think you should come on over to the other side. And from my perspective, I'm like, oh, that's the dark side. <laughs> 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 sales. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but it, it turned out to not be, you know, and he, he said, if you go on over to this side, you're going to create an entire new Rolodex for your life. I remember these words. We're sitting over at dinner in Chicago. He goes, listen, that, that, that Rolodex is going to become so much larger and that experience of what you're going to be able to offer your clients and your customers if you do go eventually go start your own company is going to be much more powerful. He said, so come on over. Why don't you start with building out business value assessments? You can sit down with these companies like a Walmart, like a United Airlines, you know, like an HSBC uh, across the world and understand what their business goals are and how you can align to those things. And those are some of the most exciting conversations an indiv individual could have. And I'm still extremely thankful that I was given that opportunity and that he, he talked me into making that move. Um, Cause Obviously, 
I wouldn't be on this podcast yeah. today with two of the biggest celebrities in the world with 350 <laughs> billion stop viewers it. from yeah. Stop Design. <laughs> true story. <laughs> true story. <laughs> Wearing <laughs> incredible <laughs> swag. <Yeah. right? laughs> Thanks. You looks great, So I started doing business value assessments. I remember sitting down um, with, with some of the greatest sales reps in the world and in, in a company like Walmart and learning what they want to be able to accomplish. Um, and we... We crushed it. We absolutely crushed it at App Dynamics. We crushed it doing business value assessments, and uh, the team at, at that time, the central team, um, you know, we were having a great time together. And then I was uh, given the opportunity to say, "Why don't you take some of the stuff that you learned when you're on the buyer side and start doing enablement?" And um, that's why I had the opportunity to, to move out and over into the enablement role while they also gave me a chance to kind of carry a bag a little bit too. So I got to sell emerging technologies also, things like business IQ and IoT and, and, and some of the analytics, things like that. And um, so I'm enabling while I'm still learning about, you know, standing in front of sellers, carrying a bag, drawing three Ys on the whiteboard, doing business value assessments, executing the entire sales process and just morph from there. It's a lot of fun. It, it's, it's a really interesting perspective. And I think this is one of the interesting you know, reasons why we got you on the show, other than obviously the great swagger. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, you've obviously stepped into an organization that's got this playbook, right? The playbook that we've spoken so much about. You know, when you're going through that playbook and you're putting the customer hat on, and then, you, so you're, 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 you're analyzing the enablement program and the sales process, um, and you're putting it, and, and you're analyzing that from from the buyer's side. What are you thinking? What's going through your mind? Are you saying, "Do you know what? I get this. This is, you know, this is trickery," or you know, what 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 is going through your mind when you're kind of like seeing that? What is this witchcraft? What, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> um, it's not. It it's really not. I, I think. I think what a lot of people. Um, and, and perhaps in sales, might not realize or step back to think about it. And I, I, I'm not the professional here either and have all the answers. But a lot of the, the best sales processes that we put in place, a lot of the activities that you do inside that sales process, they're actually built for the buyer. Mm. So I, I always say we don't do sales enablement, we do buyer enablement. And you ask I just heard you ask, what is buyer enablement, Rick? Yeah. Right? right? <laughs> it's on the, the tip of your tongue. <laughs> Ali, Simon, I can see it. <laughs> so what is buyer enablement? Mm. I mean, so we, we'll use what Gartner says. So Gartner says, puts it kind of in, in, in four categories, right? So they're problem identification, and they're going to go and do solution requirements. They're going to go then figure out, does that solution requirements fit? And then they're going to go make the investment. Um, I'm putting it in different terms, but that's yep. essentially what the buyer's journey is. Mm -hmm. If you think of it a great sales process, we are trying to enable the buyer to accomplish those things and make it easy for them. I want to enable the buyer when they're going through solution and discovery because I want to show them what are the different solutions that are out there. Every great sale, the best salespeople in the world, that's what they do. Mm. They try and feed them the information. And, and it could be white papers. It could be Gartner. It could be Forrester. Things that are out there to show, hey, this is who's the top magic quadrant. Yeah, our solution's out there too. Here's a few others. But there's a reason why they said what they did about us. Or when they're trying to align their solution, align with the right solution, the buyer is, we offer an architecture workshop. We offer a demo. We offer to sit down with people, other people that can help show them how to align that business and give them the value that they're looking for. We do business value assessments so they understand what the return on their investment is going to be. And that's why we don't skip steps either. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people hear me say, like, I'm not, I'm not going to be a dictator, yeah. but don't st skip steps in the sales process because those are all unique deposits to give back to the buyer so that they can help be the champion, make their decisions, and understand what is required to get through through their own procurement. Interesting statistic. I, I promise I'll let you guys talk in a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> this is your show. So, <laughs> um, I'm a geek on white papers and things like that. So uh, G2 just did the most recent buyer behavior report. And they said that 55% of the people that they looked at say that spending will actually go up this year. 
Um, actually, only 6% said I think the spending goes down. So it is at like 39%, whatever the difference is, says yeah. it's going to stay the same or go up also. That's really great news for a salesperson, right? Somebody who's trying to sell a solution. Spending is going up. But the other thing that's happening is 86% of them said the scrutiny is going up too. Right. So because of that, a salesperson has to figure out even more how to help educate that buyer because they're going to be going, they're going to get more scrutiny. That buyer through their internal processes, through legal, through procurement and everyone else, it's going to be harder to get that sell, that purchase through. Yeah. Um, so enablement is more important than ever for the buyer. I think this is really interesting because obviously behind buying behaviors are changing. There's so much more information. It's not just Google. There's, there's so much out there that influences and, buyers are more likely to have strong set opinions about what they think they want. How has the sales process needed to adapt to be able to help align to these changes? That, that question also was not in the pre-planned questions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> which I love even more because that means we're just having a good discussion. <laughs> I love it. So um, I'll tell you, this is where the technology side of things comes in. I, I, really, I really believe that there's a lot more innovation that's also happening to help the seller be able to sell. And, and it's not about... I know there's a lot of distractions and other tool, tools that are out there that can make things more complicated, but there's great technology out there that is also looking at, looking at who's out, who are your prospective buyers? And it's, it's through artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and putting together large language models and pulling all that together and saying, we believe these people are out there searching. We believe these are the right personas that right now are looking for a solution that's in their space. And if you can find out who out there is looking, who is shopping, what's the ecosystem around that individual that might be looking or around that company that might be looking, I think that's what helps the, the seller get an opportunity now to go and target them with data that, so they're not looking at just what Google is saying and AWS and some of these other white papers, but sending them PGing with pipeline generation, mm -hmm. pipeline generation with relevant articles that's going to help educate that buyer and maybe set the bias a little bit more in your direction. But it starts with going and finding them. And that's where I think leveraging more technology that's out there is going to help the seller give them, put that at their fingertips for them. So are you saying that the PG side is evolving in the sense that rather than just sending look at how great we are, look at these things that we're doing. It's about maybe sending useful information out to your buyer, a little bit more of a kind of a balanced perspective, industry insight that tips the balance somewhat in your, in your direction to then kind of stimulate that interest. Is that... You think about if you, if you work for a, uh, a startup tech company, um, they, it, they could even be post-IPO, but if they're not as big is some of those giants that are out there, and I won't name names, but they have humongous marketing engines and they know how to get their white papers and, and, and pay other people to talk about their products out there. You've got to figure out a way to make it break through the noise. Mm. On average, your a typical business person require, re receives about 131 emails a day. Now, that's not my stat, that's LinkedIn stat. Right. And you're trying to break through the noise of all of that that comes through there. So that means that you have, like, just going out and spraying and praying with PG, that doesn't work anymore. I believe cold calls still, there's still a place for cold calls. But after that, trying to get at somebody's laptop and show up in their email or their LinkedIn or, you know, maybe use a microsite or some type of digital sales room, something that says, hey, we think that you might be interested in reducing your, your cloud spend. Here's a couple different ways that you can do that. And if that's something that they're looking to do, you know, maybe you, maybe you take that with a white paper and marry it with a small demo and boom, that's in their email. I have just enabled that potential buyer differently than maybe what they went and found out on a, their own internet research. So I think the world of PG is changing. 
and probably going to continue to change, right? What are your predictions on the future when it comes to, you know, the the involvement of technology and the involvement of, you know, the sales process and enablement? They just, the, the typical buyer today, and I, I think this is, you know, this might stem a little bit from coming out of the pandemic, but they're doing a lot of research on their own before they even want to talk to salespeople. Mm. I, I think there's another crazy statistic out there where like over 85% of a potential buyer would like to make a purchase without even engaging mm. with sales, which means now it's product-led growth and looking at ways to be able to sell with your product first, give them a chance to get download the product or figure out a way to get them familiar with your product. Maybe it's through demo downloads. There's a lot of great solutions out there that offer that. Get them to have that aha moment. That wasn't a good snap. Get them, get them to have that aha <laughs> moment right there. <laughs> Don't worry. We're, we're, we'll impose a, uh, a, a light above your head oh, on that perfect. one. Perfect, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you I'm going to sit here the whole time <laughs> trying to do this. <laughs> um, and have that aha moment that this product's going to solve my challenges. And guess what? It's also going to work for the rest of the, maybe the rest of my team and other teams. Yeah. And then allow the salesperson to come in and engage and expand and show them other edge use cases. By the way, that actually makes the, that actually makes the role of sales a lot easier too. Mm. But it requires a different investment from that company to be able to do product-led growth. And if you can marry the two together, I honestly believe that's, that's the best company that's going to be out there. You're making sales easier. You're leading with product-led growth. So your cost of sale is much lower than it typically would be. Um, and you're using technology to help sell. It's, 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 an incredible, it's an incredible view and probably quite mind-boggling for lots of our you know, audience to really start to, to analyze that. But I think it's... Uh, it, it's really interesting information. And Ali, sorry, mm. just not to mm. interrupt, because I know your audience mm. th that's listening to this, it's not taking away the the need to still go do great discovery, yeah. do the value framework, um, understand defensible differentiation and all the different, and how your solution requirements, all of that is still 100% necessary, but it does help the seller get in front of yeah. the buyer where they've already kind of bought in a little bit on your solution. So, so what are some simple steps that, you know, that when it comes to PGing, when it comes to bearing everything we've just spoken about in mind, what advice can you give to, you know, our audience that are sellers that are out in the field and out in the trenches, you know, trying to stand out and amongst all this noise? So the first thing is, before you press the send button on anything you do, yeah. ask yourself, is this unique? Am I being unique? Like, am I putting as much context into here as possible? Is there an attachment I should put in here? Is there a small demo? Is my SE, is an SE, like when I'm doing the, the playback on a, on a proof of value or proof of concept, um, should I take little snippets and put it in a video? Am I making this shareable? Is it making it, am I sending this in a way that it can be shared across lots of different people inside of a company because I might not have a chance to go meet with all of them. So imagine anything that you put into an email, anything that you might send that potential buyer, making it super easy for them to also go sell internally and share it without requiring a meeting from you. Mm -hmm. That's like the very first, that's breaking through the noise better than yep. what most sellers are probably doing today. My second bit of advice would be, and this isn't for the seller, this is as a company. If you are a company and you are looking at trying to keep your cost of sale rel relatively low, but you want to keep your productive capacity as high as possible, surround your sales team with the tools that make their job easier. So if we go back to the comment I made about there's going to be much more scrutiny for the sale today, then that means there's going to be more security assessments. There's going to be more RFPs. There's going to be more legal and redlining scrutiny, more engagement with the procurement. What are the things in every single stage of the sales process that you could offer to, instead of just hiring more people, make it easier right at the fingertips for a seller to be able to do that? Which, you know, I know everybody's talking about this, but it's probably AI. Yeah. And I, I don't want to use it like the word like back when... Uh, was it what, cloud was a big thing, and yeah, everyone's yeah. like, "Oh yeah, that that's up that's up in the cloud." It's like, <laughs> what 
where's the cloud? What does that mean? Oh yeah, that's got AI. I'm uh, pretty sure my hat does not have AI on it. By the way, my hat says RevLogic.com. <laughs> Carry on, please. So you, you, you've, got, you've got to point two. Where's point three and four? <laughs> so th- that's that's looking at how can we be provide a digital assistant or something yeah. for the seller to continue to make their job easier as they're getting beaten up mm. by the buyer for more scrutiny. Mm. That's my only point. And mm. you could do that a lot of different ways, but it's like looking at every stage in the sales process and figuring out how can we invest in that seller Mm. without just going and hiring a whole cr- crap load of people <laughs> um, to do so that. Who's, whose responsibility is that? Is that the responsibility of the AE to, to seek out that information or the seller to seek out that information? Is it, the, is it the responsibility of the organization to ensure that they provide it? How, how do you create an, a, you know, so that system in itself works that the, the A's are, or the sellers are armed with the right information. So let's go full circle again. Cool. Started with the conversation around enablement. Yeah. I believe it is the role of enablement. Right. I believe it is the role of ops, rev ops and revenue enablement. Because if your job, if you think about it as an enablement person, your job's not just give training, badges, certification, e-learning. If none of that actually ends up going in increasing revenue, then who who gives a crap, right? Mm. But if, I said crap, you know I said say yeah, that word. Right, yeah. right, okay. <laughs> it's a family a, show. Though. I know. It's a family show. Yeah. Like, I, I don't I'm positive my think, 10-year-old daughter is going to watch this. She, so. She's aspiring to be a software <laughs> seller or something. I hope she? not, but I think she's going to watch it because daddy's <laughs> yeah, on it. Yeah, okay, so. okay, fair enough. Um, and, by the, and it's famous, and you guys are famous. So when I tell her that I was on <laughs> with hundreds of unicorns, she's going to be like, oh, unicorns? Uh, with yeah. those two pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, bring it full, full roll back. Yeah. If your job is to enable revenue, then it's to look at different ways that you can help be able to do that across the entire sales process, help your sellers be able to help the channel be able to help, uh, your customer success teams to be able to, it's the full gamut looking yeah. at all of that. Yeah. Which, which this probably leads quite nicely and you know, and, and, and my point, you know, for larger organizations that have a, you know, a very robust enablements, you know, solution and team. What about in those earlier stage organizations where they don't necessarily have all of those elements in the organization? I know we can now probably point at RevLogic right now <laughs> to say this is probably where you come to you, right? <laughs> but no, ha, you know, how how does, you know, the earliest stage startups, you know, get access to that? And, you know, how, what advice can you give, give those that don't necessarily have the enablement program in place? So this is a... Um... It's funny. I, I won't I won't give the company's names at the moment. Yeah. Uh, maybe off the air. But yeah. when j- just just this morning and a couple calls I had yesterday, um, where they were early stage companies, and we were talking about the power of enablement and why to have that in place, and they hadn't. Their growth was one hundred percent last year. Their growth is probably going to be one hundred percent the next year. They're not feeling the struggle. Mm. of having some of those operational tools in place, being able to put in AI to help be kind of a digital assistant to the sales team, building enablement programs, because they haven't, they haven't hit that yet. And I can just, I, I just say there's a matter of really looking forward then in that case and saying, all right, maybe I'm doing 16 million this year and it's no problem trying to get to 32 and maybe 32 to 64 and 64 up to 128. Am I doing the multiples correctly? So. Is that, okay, so. I'll stop there. Good. I'll yeah. stop there because that's as far as I you go. Blank it out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Edit it. <laughs> um, but when they want, if everyone's goal is to have an exit strategy and they think about what their exit strategy is, don't wait till when you go from 124 and you can only get to 132 because now everything you've been doing doesn't scale unless right. you have those foundational places. And, and you could lose a year or two in revenue growth because now I've got to build all those foundational things. You almost have to rip out a little bit, undo a little bit, or try and do it while the bus is rolling in full speed down the road, which is really hard to do too. Mm-hmm. So there, I, the only thing I would just encourage is that early, early stage, already start to put some of those in place before you actually feel the pressure because then you can just keep, you can just keep growing and you're not going to hit that bottleneck. 
makes complete sense. Is there a so? Is there a sweet spot? Is there a point where you think this is kind of non-negotiable? You absolutely need to start thinking about this without I, your you, bias. You, you without to, your you, bias, you had to let him ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to get the technical answer? <laughs> I was wondering how that worked too. Like, <laughs> he's he's going to get into detail. Magic? Like, did you tap behind uh, the absolutely. shoulder? Go like, in, no, it's your go turn. In. He's, he's answering these on. questions too <laughs> simply. <laughs> going to do his own meeting. Um, you know, I, I, I actually don't know if there's a sweet spot number for that, but I do believe there's probably a sweet spot and number of salespeople. So if I take a look at what my current attainment is, across the board of my sales team, actually looking at it individually too. Um, so how many people are hitting their quota? And I'd say when that, when that number starts to decrease is the time to say, right, how do I put good foundational enablement in place? Or if you've got an, or if you have an aggressive hiring plan for the next year, if I'm going to go hire 10 sales reps and the other 10 that you have today are out there busy selling, and making money for the company? Do I want them distracted with doing their own enablement? Or do I want to start putting in some type of onboarding program? And do I want to get them ramped as fast as possible? One year ramp doesn't work today anymore. You got to get people ramped six months or even sooner if possible. Now, it depends on how difficult the product is to learn. But in a lot of cases, especially in startup, it, sh it should be less than six months for the ramp time. Mm. I want them productive, making money. And by the way, um, that's making money solves all attrition problems. Mm. <laughs> so um, that's how I would answer that question. Yeah. And that was no bias. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, 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 it, it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, you know, in the early, early days, you're obviously just trying to put out fires. You're obviously chasing and, and any distraction and a distraction uh, that deviates from that obviously can seem unproductive. But at the same time, there's kind of a, a, a shift where you obviously stop just chasing and you actually start becoming a little bit more prescribed in terms of what, when you can actually start creating something that is scalable. At the beginning, you've got nothing to scale, which is chasing revenue. So it's just interesting to kind of get your perspective on that. Mm. I think, you know, going back to, you know, the, the, the playbook, and I think you've had a very, very unique perspective. How long have you now worked within the playbook community? When did you start App Dynamics in... Let's see. So um, probably about 10 years now. About 10 years. Yeah, overall. So, so obviously you were born into the playbook. Obviously you've had some, you know, you worked with some phenomenal people that have no doubt helped shape different elements of the playbook. I go back to, you know, your, your comment at the beginning when you were talking about Alex Verrill, you know, and a, and a specific thing that it, he was very good at or, you know, um, or Flo that was very good at this specific bit. Do you believe that with the time that you've sat in the seat, that each of the elements that you had at the playbook, and let's call it playbook version one, to how you've now been able to evolve that playbook by having the experience of working with really good people that have been, you know, the specialist in one element of that that's really helped you to create and, and shape what the playbook was and where it is now. Yeah, I, 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 I truly believe that. And again, I, I, I owe that to all the people that I've had an opportunity to work with. Um, I, I mean, I think we're doing some work with, with Spencer, um, who I think you're, you're yeah, releasing yeah. his show yeah, today. Today, is it to, today, today, yeah. today. The big announcement and release of Spencer Tuttle, which, by the way, who got to set and, you know, he was like in a nice, big, like tall, <laughs> blue velvet chair in his show. And you guys had a nice, big velvet couch. Um, I won't bring it up now, but... Yeah, there's better, li there's better I, lighting in this studio. Right, You're going to okay, look a lot better Because it looked that. like he's a pretty fancy, like, <laughs> man, you rolled it all out for Spence. Yeah, <laughs> right, you, you've, you've got it all here. <laughs> but the reason I bring his name up is because, you know, it's been a while since him and I had worked together over at AppDynamics. Yeah. And he's, he's in a wonderful, great opportunity now over at Redis, great company. And... We're, we're, we were re-engaged for, for helping build sales process and a few other things. And it was, it was just enlightening to sit down and, you know, he's gathered a few different experiences on the way. I've gathered a few different experiences on the way. And we come together to what I think is even a more evolved thing of what we had 
done in the done in the past. Mm. Um, not to say that that didn't work great when we were over at App Dynamics because it did. We, we we crushed it over there. But we think that you know I, I think that as the years go on, you continue to adapt, continue to add, maybe subtract a couple things that mm-hmm. didn't work out that well. And the biggest thing that you, word I'd use is innovate. Yeah, you're, you're innovating together. So just bringing this back to the you know, the actual sellers that are out there kind of in the field and selling. Is there anything that's changed, perhaps, things that used to work, they're not working so much anymore, or things, or or the common mistakes that you kind of see day to day from your perspective? A lot of companies nowadays are talking about, like, just get to the product. The product will sell itself. Mm. I, I think that is a common mistake that's out there. I agree the product can sell itself, but you definitely don't want to shortcut the things that are in between there because the product might sell itself for a $100,000 ASP. But as you start going into your Fortune 500 companies and start trying to get into the, the larger companies that are out there, it's, it's going to sell itself to maybe just one individual, but you want it to sell itself to the CFO. And that's not going to happen if I just go sprint to a demo or go sprint to a POV. And that is why the importance of exe- of what everyone talks about on this show, what they do, is you can't skip that. But customers are really busy. Oh, he's right? asking another question. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> customers are really busy. They're time poor. They've got lots of vendors to obviously assess. And they don't necessarily want to go through your sales steps and your sales process. They just want to get to the product and make a decision themselves. How do you, how do you combat that? Again, um, make buying easy, buyer enablement. I don't know a company that doesn't go out there and still do some type of research on what they're investing into. They're not doing some type of ROI. I used to do it when I was on the other side. Every single investment we ever made had an ROI model to it. I had to put that in in, in with the project plan. We called them P-codes. And that P-code got assigned the ROI analysis. So they're still doing those things. And as a seller, if I can show them, you're going to do it anyways. You have to do it. And if I can come on, come off a little bit unbiased, if I can come off a little bit more consultative... I'm just here to, I, I can actually help you speed this up and make it easier for you. Meanwhile, that other vendor that you're working with, they might slow stuff down for you. But that's the, that's the biggest role is, yep, I, I get it. You're going to think our sales process is complex, but it's actually for the buyer. And as long as I come off as it's for the buyer, then I, I don't understand why a company would not want to engage with you at some fashion. So what what happens if the customer's already gone through some of those processes already and you know they're just saying just take me to take me to demo are you going to slow it down or are you going to go and assess what they have how are you going to tackle that um so just cuz the sales process typically has boxes next to each other and kind of in sequence um don't tell anybody especially your 350 million viewers that you have but some of this stuff can be done in parallel um, you can walk somebody back without letting them know you're walking them back because they don't see your sales process. But I can still ask a few more qualifying questions. I can still ask to meet a couple more people. Um, I can do a demo and I can do a POV while I'm running a business value assessment at the same time. Actually, and a lot of companies do that. It's okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a roadblock. So obviously in a world of PLG or a world where there is much more appetite for get me to the demo, obviously we're talking about the change in the buyer behaviors. Have things had to change or, or, or what are the things I suppose that have maybe changed and, and kind of talk, talk us through some of the things that you've seen through those various stages of the sales process or is it the same? Buying behaviors have definitely changed. They, de- they, they definitely have. And they, they've, let's look at it from both sides of the fence. So the buyer now is typically at home. They're typically over a Zoom meeting. Um, they are distracted by taking their kids to soccer practice. 
The FedEx person just showed up. The dog puked on the floor. <laughs> Who knows what's going on over there in that household? But I can tell you that they're not 100% focused on you. And the days of walking into a meeting room and sitting down with them and knowing that if you give them some great burritos and <laughs> some of the best pizza in town and the best donuts and coffee, you're going to have their undivided attention for maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And you might be able to get a couple more people in that meeting room. It, on both sides, it is way harder. So they are distracted. They're at home. They're in front of this thing right here. Mm. And they are have the ability to go and, and research on their own. The, they, they think they can do everything from the laptop. In most cases, they can. So now you're dealing with the distractions. You don't have their attention. They're doing their own research. So as a seller, I've got to figure out how to get stuff that they would normally be searching for online in front of them. I've got to figure out how to put it into a format that they are, that's engaging and interesting. So the first meeting deck, if you're still doing first meeting decks in a basic PowerPoint, you're probably not keeping their attention. Like, there's got to be new ways of trying to engage what with that buyer. Ways? It could be animation, more video, more micro videos, um, digital sales rooms, it, um, something you know, interactive in the same in the same piece of paper. So what I mean by that is like, it, I just I just did a recap of our conversation. Actually, I'll go I'll take one step back. So. There's meeting notes. There's tons of tools out there that do meeting notes. What if I could take my meeting notes and put them in the format of a three Ys, which a lot mm. of people here use? What if I could put it in the form of a value pyramid? Things that recap the meeting that might be useful for the buyer. It gets sent over to them. They can update it right there interactively. You can go back and forth. Next thing you know, or, or jo get together in a Slack. Mm. Get, use a Slack meeting. Everyone's got Slack today. Go back and forth on that. Don't make it so difficult to get exchange information back and forth. Oh, we got to set up another calendar. Let's go and coordinate schedules. You know what? I'm available three months from now uh, for 45 minutes with these other six people that I want to bring in. What's happening during that time frame? You're losing momentum. Other people are talking to them. You got to figure out a way how to engage with them as fast as possible and as much as possible. Do you think the industry is embracing these changes? And, from, I'm, and I'm talking from a playbook perspective. Do you think there's the, the the rapid adaptation that is required, or do you think that there is some reluctance? Or, or help help us understand the current state of what that looks like right now relative to the things that you're talking about and the innovation. So um, another another little statistic is 58% want to adopt these new technologies and digital, digital solutions. Um, the problem is that it's not embedded into what they do. So there is a lot, uh, BDRs today, they're using a lot of these new AI tools, um, but they're they're, they're getting the trials, the free trials and all that and testing it out on their own. They've not been trained. It is not showing up in new hire and boot camp and the sales process. Salespeople want to adopt it. They're going out again and doing some of their own downloads and trials of it, but it's not, it's not ingrained into, into what they're doing every single day. And I think that's the role of the company to say, we know you want to adopt it, so we're going to go ahead and just embed it into our operational cadence of what we do. And that's where they're going to get the value out of it. Because if you're doing it as one-offs, um, it, it might not work as well, um, or it's not going to drive the adoption in that company that you want. So do you think that tooling should actually then be baked into the sales process, kind of ingrained and you know, in a much more organic way? I do. I do. I think it should be, it should be interactive, Sales process should be interactive. I should be able to go to the sales process and click on every single thing, whether it's a gold standard, whether it's the template, whether it's the training, whether it's the tool that I need to use in that stage that's going to make me more effective, but don't make the seller bounce around to 16 different modules or octatiles or wherever else um, to go try and find these different tools. One central hub, very easy for them to do and be able to execute. That's what drives, that's what puts in the DNA of the company and drives adoption. So obviously, you know, a lot of organizations don't have that. Is there a place that sellers can go and find some of these tools to make them, their lives easier 
of their own accord? And where, where would they start to find these tools? So, um, a lot of a lot of it comes through word of mouth. So, it, you know, just where they're talking to other friends in their community. Same thing, anything. Honestly, that's the way all, all selling is. Mm-hmm. Word of mouth is probably sometimes the best way. So, if they hear of somebody using... Um, so bad I want to give company names. I, I probably shouldn't, right? I mean, you guys are a big thing. If I plug yeah. one person, next thing you know, their revenue is going to go through the there roof. You go. There and you then, go. you know, they, they should probably give you guys some royalties there on that go. for sure. Well, we could um, some I'm going to ask we for some go. royalties. We, we, <laughs> try to get some stock. It's inside trading. It's right. So let's pause this for just a minute. I'll tell you what names I'm going to say. Wink, wink. Um... Yeah, but there, I mean, some of the tools out there that help make PG available, like they, they're out there testing it out. Some and salespeople are do, sometimes doing their, even their own demos of those tools. Um, but a simple search on just something's going to come up. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's what I would offer. Or talk, talk to other people in other companies that are doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like there's companies like Google and Salesforce and that. They're like, they're, they're now creating just their own AI tools team. Yeah. So they still have an ops team and they still might have an IT team, but they, they are literally staffing and you can go out there and, and search for this. They have their own AI teams now that they're staffing that are focused on just being able to improve the effectiveness and the execution and the efficiency of the company through AI. And that's their sole goal. Now, I'm not saying like, Google's huge, so I'm not saying that companies should go do that, but that's that's how much of a belief there is out there that it can have an impact and help people be able to execute on what they're doing. I don't believe it's there to replace. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't believe it's there to replace. And I'll say that to anyone. I believe it's there to help improve on what you do. Yeah. You cannot replace human, great human intelligence and mastery of what we do today. I think right? the, absolutely. Amen. I think yes. The, what, one of the other big things that you speak about, and the, in our discovery, you know, we, you, you, I think you've got a huge amount of passion for, which is all about you know the formula for predictable and repeatable success. Can you help us understand a little bit about what that formula is and some of the fundamentals of that? Yeah. So, again, if if we look, if we define success as revenue, use the word revenue again. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of things that go into trying to accomplish revenue. The model I use is I, I'm trying to make any, everybody as productive as possible. I believe that if you can make a go-to market team as productive as possible and get them to the highest productive capacity, everything else works itself out. I, my forecasts become a lot become really easy. Um, my hitting the revenue goals become really easy. Maybe I'm even looking at ways of like, how do we defer money? That's a great problem to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's called sandbagging. Yeah. 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 Sand yeah. We're sandbagging yeah, 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 yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so things that might go into that productive capacity uh, model, like how do you get somebody there productive as possible? So I've got to hire great. Mm-hmm. And so it is my time to hire and who I'm hiring. And, and there's programs to help be able to do that. I'm sure people on the show have talked about three R's. Yep. I, um, then you're looking at how do I create the best onboarding in place? I'm a big fan of onboarding somebody before they even start. There's no reason why you can't start engaging with that potential hire and sharing them, this is how we position. This is a little bit about what our solution does. Here's a couple of videos that you can walk through that are demos of our product. Here's, here's what your territory is likely going to be. And you can start building your PG plan, five by five, whatever version you're going to use. If they're doing all those things before they even walk through the doors of the company, well, one, I'm, they're already onboarding faster. Two, they're even getting more excited to come on over. Three, they're probably not going to change their mind about coming on over to your company. Then we go into um, pipeline generation. So if you're getting somebody who believes in PG, you've built a PG culture inside your your company, they believe that they are the general manager of their own business, which means that I'm controlling the amount of at-bats that I get, how I get them, and then how I convert them, which brings me to my next thing is conversion, new business meeting conversion. So teaching somebody... How do I be able to convert that new business meeting 
into a visible opportunity? How do I crush it the very first time I do that? So NBM conversion. And then it's going to be converting that VO and being able to demonstrate value. If I can do all those things, that all leads into productive capacity. Those are kind of all the steps. And then the final one is about customer expansion or consumption, because a lot of companies are going to consumption models now. Mm -hmm. So how am I making money while I'm sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you've got enablement programs, if you've got tools that support them through that entire journey to get to productive capacity, the things I just rattled off, um, I think everything else works itself out. So obviously a lot of this, the burden of a lot of this actually falls on the organization to obviously create the right infrastructure and the right environment for, for individuals. Some some people, some organizations just don't have that set up. Is there anything that individuals can do to really kind of give themselves the best chance? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. Maybe one, one that comes to mind. Other than that, I just can't think anything yeah. else. But <laughs> yeah, for anybody that's actually listening to this and not watching on a video, he has just pulled out the hat again. Okay. Rev Logic. <laughs> Dot com. What is it? Rev hyphen logic dot com. Is it? <laughs> so anyway, that'll work. That'll work. I'll make sure that the uh, <laughs> if not, I'm gonna sure you have the QR code when yeah. you launch yeah. this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is uh, there there absolutely is. So you don't if you most companies understand the productive capacity model. Um, other, it's very difficult to do headcount forecasting without it. So anyone can just dissect it and say, okay, how do I make this person more productive? Um, and that's the things that I, I just talked about, right? You know, it, how, how are we going to improve on our hiring? Who are we going to hire? Are we going to hire a person that's um, never done this before? And, or we want to hire somebody who's a little more experienced. If they don't, if they've never done this before, then we got to invest in enablement and put that in place and the tools to be able to do them. But I think any company can dissect a productive capacity model because they have to do it for a great hiring forecast and understand how they're going to basically make their call for the next quarter and the next year. This is a good time to talk about. We've, we, we, we've, we've mentioned the name RevLogic, but, <laughs> but what is RevLogic? What are you guys doing and, and how are you differentiating yourselves in this market at the moment? Oh, well, thank there you for we asking Here's that. That's very nice. We'll cut this anyway, so. <laughs> uh, and I, no, we're uh, hundreds of unicorns is out of time. <laughs> um, basically, we're, we're trying to build revenue enablement as a service. I, we need one more service model out there we in the market, another right? Another we need one. another ass out yeah. there, do we? <laughs> -ass. Yeah, I know. What a great category to be in. <laughs> I haven't got Gartner yet to go ahead and build the magic quadrant out for just this one alone, but um, we're still working on it. The it's a lot of companies don't have enablement's become a big thing out there in the market today. I, I'd say that's one of the things I, I've been watching throughout my journey, my career of how more and more companies are realizing you've got to have this in place. And again, it's not just about certifications and training. It, enablement role has grown exponentially inside of a company. And I think it's still a tough role to hire for. I think it's tough to find a team of people to do it. And RevLogic is a collective group of what I would consider some of the best operators in the business that have done this. We've got the templates, we've got the training, we've got the people. Every single person on the team has lived in the shoes of enablement. There's no gimmicks. There's no people that don't understand what it's like to go through the same challenges that the CROs and the VP of sales and customer success are. And that's what we want to offer back out there to other companies is saying, listen, we can come in there. We could probably do it faster. Um, we can definitely do it quicker because it takes a while to ramp up and build out an enablement team. Um, and we know it's going to be much more effective. And the other thing that I think is a little bit different from us than others is we're really trying to also look at the digital, the AI side of things. Again, I am, I am very sympathetic to actually how hard it is to sell today and even how hard it is to buy today. Mm. And I think that if you can help create those digital teammates, better digital solutions, things that are going to be able to help the seller be able to sell, 
we want to be on the leading cusp of that too. So I'll give you an example. Every week we do, almost every week, I shouldn't say that. Mm. Um, we try and do demo days. And that is just inviting some of the newest AI stealth disruptors in the business. They could be series A. They might even be at seed round. But we want to learn about their technologies and their solutions. And we're making them technology partners ours. Um, because if they're disruptors and they're looking for opportunities and sometimes they're thinking outside of the, the typical box that's out there, um, we want to we want to offer that to customers that have an opportunity to see them versus some of the big giants that are out there that are going to cost these companies an arm and a leg. They don't have the money to invest in some of these big companies today, but maybe they have the money mm. to invest in a small stealth disruptor or even get a beta opportunity with them to be able to learn like, what is it to have a tool that actually manages my productive capacity for me or actually throws me new prospects for my sales team or helps me do automated discovery and builds value pyramids all on its own. And then the, the salesperson just needs to redline a little bit or add some more additional context. Um, and actually, that's, my, that's, what I, that's actually what excites me in the morning is I love looking at some of these new solutions that are coming out there. Yeah and helping them out. Yeah. Well, where do your services start and where do they stop? Where's your sweet spot? What's, what, what, what? So, um, it does, you guys, we've talked about this, mm. right? And I think you're kind of in the same ballpark with the playbook community. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can honestly say that one of the biggest challenges I've had is because I'm, I'm back selling again. Mm. I, I'm doing four or five sales calls a day trying to sell RevLogic. And, um, so I'm learning my ICP and I'm learning the people that where I think we can live with them a longer time and, and offer a lot more value to them versus others. And I, I think it's people from the playbook community. I really do. I think it's people that, that they understand um, the same playbooks that I've, I've kind of grown up in and had that opportunity to be part of. And um, they're looking to do some type of transformational change in their company, or they stepped in and they're going to take a series A or series B company for a hot ride. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. um, those are the ones that we want to be with because we also think that we're going to give them the most maximum value too. I am, I am not looking to just come in, put in some training, put in a couple playbooks and walk out. I'm not interested in that business at all. I am interested in being the same way you would look at a VAR or an IT partner, or some other type of business partner. That's what we want to be. We want to be their revenue partner. And so there is no starting and stopping. If those are the goals of the CRO, those are the goals, or the founder, those are the goals of RevLogic. Those are, my, those are our company's goals too. And what are the different parts of that that they would actually get within that? Is it just, is it messaging? Is it just training of sales process? Is it... ICP workshops, help us understand the kind of the full extent of that. Yeah. So it's all of that, but really where it starts is understanding what's your revenue goals. So I'll give the example of if you want to get to 36 million next year, you want to get to 200 million next year, there's going to be different things that you're doing to try and get that. And we like to first start off just I just want to understand what you're trying to accomplish. We're going to do, I hate to use the word assessment because it sounds so formal, but it's essentially that. It is just, we're going to, we're going to try and understand what are the different growth levers that we're going to evaluate to get to that. So what's your pipeline? Where's your pipeline coming from? Do you have enough pipeline to be able to get to that goal? How's your sales team execute? Do you have the conversion rates to be able to do that? Do you have the hiring program in place? Um, building, building all the tools that are going to help them with that. Then I want to look at your channel because channel, a, a lot of people, don't look at what the channel is bringing in or don't have channel programs in place. But they, but that's an important part to scale the business. You've got to have a working channel. Um, <laughs> I know there's bias there. And so, right? Some it's people might be a just say, bias, that's, that's a whole episode. That's, 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 that's a whole series. Please invite me back when I talk about that. But if you have a good working channel, you look at some of the largest companies in the world, they're doing it with a, with a, with a channel system that works. Um, you got to have product-led growth, right? The entire revenue goals of that company do not have to be just on the sales team. Mm. And I would argue that that's not even fair. And then, um, so looking at all of the, and customer expansion growth, right? How am I expanding with my existing customers? How am I getting new products, new features in front of them? And that doesn't have to come from sales either. That could come from customer 
training portals. Um, it can come from your advocacy programs. It can be come through your communities from other people. Um, it, there's levers in every single one of those. So that's what we do. That's where we start is saying, let's look at all the different growth levers that can happen. And where, where do we think it's going to create a bottleneck? Or from what I'm looking at, your revenue goal doesn't have to be 36 million because it could probably be 50 million or it could be 60 million. Let me show you if we make a couple turns on these other, in these other areas, what that could become. Um, and I think a great business partner, a revenue business partner should have those conversations with companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I think, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And I think, you know, we've, we've been talking for a while now and, you know, it's, it's clear we're going to continue to talk and, you know, yeah, as it, oh, as I was hoping you'd say yeah, that. Oh, we, we're there. You're going to be friends oh, for life now. Be a bro. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to absolutely There's hugs, hugs happening. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, what the big part of why we set up Hunters and Unicorns and the podcast was, you know, to to give content, to give, you know, useful information and theoretically forms of enablement coming from others to help support the community that supported us so much. And, you know, I think there are, we've, we've barely scratched the surface of the subjects. And I think there's going to be lots of subjects out there that people are going to want to support with. And, and I don't know how you feel about this, Rick, but, you know, it'd be great to have some interaction from, you know, the people that are listening to this and, you know, reach out to us. If there's a specific subject, you know, that you want to talk about or that you need support on, it could be around how we go, you know, use artificial intelligence. It could be, you know, as a first line leader wanting to understand more around, you know, the, the, the those KPIs and those leading indicators that you need to follow. So we're open to any suggestions that any of the, you know, our audience, you know, want to find out more about. And we, you know, we'd we'd love to welcome you back onto the show, and maybe just do some short little snippets on um, each of those subjects. We can dive a little bit deeper if there is some common themes and some, you know, some some common, you know, subjects that people want to want to follow up on. Because I think, you know, what you bring and your insight and the the people that you've worked with and the hands on experience that you've had in these great organisations, you know, trailblazing in, in in sales, you know, I think you could add a huge amount of uh, you know support to our community. And I'll just tell you, um, I consider myself a student. I don't consider myself an expert. And I guarantee the other. 600 million viewers that you have <laughs> might know more. <laughs> 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 the power that we have here. Uh, so your other 600 million viewers that you have are might know more about AI. They might know more about discovery. They might know more about pipeline generation tools out there. So I, I, I would humbly say that I would love expertise. I would love people to provide feedback, ideas, back to hunters and unicorns and, and, and try and create these, these thought leadership mm. rooms uh, to be able to share this because I, I can't be on top of the hottest, I think there's like 16 or 1800 AI tools yeah. out there today. There's no way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, but I know but the lens that you can bring, and I think that's again, another suggestion to any of our audience that have seen a bit of technology or seen some sort of, um, you know, tool that can support them, then, you know, bring it to our attention. We can put it in front of Rick and Rick, maybe you can do some analysis on it and see if it can add value and how it can add value Love and to. where it can be implemented in the sales process and, to. you know, to support others. So, yeah. Great. Great idea. I think this is where we reflect on what we've spoken about today, Rick. It's obviously been, you know, it's been, it's been a really, really interesting session. And, and obviously, you're someone that's worked so closely with many of the, you know, the great leaders, that the, the lineage that this whole series and whole podcast is kind of built on. And, and I, I just want to really talk a bit about, you know, what, what I've taken and what we've learned from today is just to really understand what enablement is. You know, I think, you know, enablement can be mis, misunderstood as, as kind of training or, you know, you come in, there's concepts, you get the whiteboard out and you just basically get people on message. The reality is that there's a lot more to it. And, um, you know, enablement is exactly that. It's actually enabling your buyers to be able to buy your solution and really aligning that. And what are the different levers? What are the different metrics? What are the different tools? What are the different processes and methods that will essentially allow you to 
better aligned to that buying process? How do you track that? And then how do you become more efficient at repeating that at scale? And, and the impact that can have on the individual sellers is, you know, you spend more of your time and more of your energy where you're going to win. And that's ultimately what enablement is. And if organizations are able to repeat that and scale that, obviously you get much more productivity, you get much more ROI, you get growth. And I think enablement is such a fundamental and core and a misunderstood part of the success of so many organizations. So really want to thank you for spending the time and really helping us understand more about, you know, about this topic, some of the changes, but also helping us understand about your amazing journey. And we wish you the very best of luck with uh, RevLogic and the, and the onward future. I appreciate you guys having me on here. Um, I'm going to reflect on podcasts for just a second. Come on. So I give a story. My wife would be shocked that I'm giving this story to oh, your 930 <laughs> million viewers that you guys have. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we've traveled now. <laughs> so um, uh, about a, a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, my daughter was diagnosed with, with type 1 diabetes. And I'm telling, I don't tell the story because of that. I tell the story because um, my wife started listening to podcasts. I was not a huge fan of podcasts at the time. Just wasn't the first thing. I'd have the radio on. I'd play music while I'm in the car normally. And she would have a podcast on. And it would be this, I'm going to make a plug. Um, it would be for this podcast called Juice Box. And it's all about how to cope with the life of type 1 diabetic. And when, so I, I would... I literally would tease her when she'd get in the car, like, oh, another podcast. Don't you listen to music anymore? <laughs> You're no fun. Things like that. Obviously, it's it's harmless because obviously she's, she's trying to help my 10-year-old daughter. Um, and a, a few months ago, um, we had to order a new controller. And we're looking at how the instruction booklet comes out and there's the instructions. But instead of going to the instructions, we go to the podcast, this juice box podcast, because we don't want to know how to set up basically the configurations and how to make our daughter working as well as possible with her blood sugar from the instruction booklet. We want to hear from the best. We want to know who is, how do the best to do it yeah. that are on this podcast. And I just want to say to you guys that you know, you're, there's instructions out there on how for salespeople to be able to execute. But what you're offering is not the instructions. You're offering what is the best, hearing from the best, knowing from the best, so that salespeople and everyone in the go-to-market community can come to your podcast and be able to listen to that. And I think I've completely changed my mind on it. Um, and I think you guys create, and, and people that do podcasts in general are creating a, an incredible forum for people to learn much more than what just comes in the instructions. So kudos to you guys. So I'm honored to be here in front of your 934 million viewers that you have on this show and be part of that. And I'm very thankful that um, you've given me the time of day. Oh, thank you. Really, really kind of you to say that. And thank you ever so much. Um, I think, you know, not not only have you been, you know, added such tremendous value to, to to our audience and, you know, further content, you've brought some phenomenal energy into the studio <laughs> today. So, you know, I've I loved every minute of this. So thanks ever so much thank you. for coming in and doing that session with us. And as I said, this won't be the last time that we hear from Rick. Rick will be on the show. <laughs> Please do really kind of comment, do what I said earlier, which is really start to share some of the things that, you know, you may be struggling with and we can maybe look at producing some um, bespoke content around those subjects. Um, but to all our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you've liked what you've heard, please do subscribe to our various channels on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. All the, in, the links are in the description below. And don't forget to look at the RevLogic new website. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, look forward everyone. to working soon. Bye. Thank you.